Tuscany, golden heart of Italy. Florence is the present capital of Tuscany, a city of art and joie de vivre. In 1300, Florence had a population of about 1,000 inhabitants and at the end of the 14th century was ruled by a few leading families which not only financed churches but also competed in building magnificent palaces. Of these, the Medici family proved themselves to be the most genial and mighty. Cosimo the Elder behaved like a normal citizen, yet let his family's wealth benefit the entire city. For five centuries, the Medici family amassed unbelievable treasures which were later donated to the city. In Florence lived important artists and sculptors like Donatello, Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. Also the writers Dante and Boccaccio and scientists such as Galileo Galilei. Built in 1059, the consecrated Battistero is one of the oldest buildings in the city. Together with the gilded Paradise Gate, the colossal dome mosaics and the eight meter tall statue of Christ, depicted as ruler of the world, the realization of which was the combined work of many artists. With the three naves of the Gothic Cathedral and the Campanile, the city's cathedral square is rather cramped. After the cathedrals in Rome, Milan and London, the Florentine Cathedral is the fourth largest Christian church. Just next to the Palazzo Medici is the residential church of San Lorenzo. Michelangelo created the unfinished Medici tombs in the Chapel of the Dead and the Royal Chapel which is decorated with the semi-precious stones of San Lorenzo. Tuscany was named after the Etruscans, who were called Tuscae by the Romans, thus land of the Etruscans. After the Western Roman Empire came the East Goths and then the Langobards. The kingdom was eventually divided into independent dukedoms and from 1531 the Medici ruled, a family of businessmen and bankers. Eventually the dukedom fell to the house of Lothringen Habsburg and 12 years later became part of unified Italy under King Vittorio Emmanuel II.
In 1434, Pope Eugen IV gave the Dominicans of Fiesole the dilapidated convent of San Marco, for which Cosimo de' Medici financed its restoration. In the oldest part of the complex, the cloister of Holy Antonio, are frescoes of Frau Angelico. The Piazza Santissima Annunziata is one of the most beautiful of the city. The arcade walkways harmoniously appear on all sides of the square. In 1419, the first orphanage in Europe was founded by the Guild of Silk Traders. The church and square of Santa Maria Novella form an impressive whole. A businessman, Giovanni Rocelli, financed the modernization of the facade of this 13th century Dominican church. In the middle of the convent area, the cloister is an oasis of tranquility. Artistic marble gravestones adorn the floor of the cloister and colorful wall frescoes demonstrate its former splendor. Unfortunately, Frequent floods destroyed much of its treasures. On a hill south of Arno, our visit to Florence comes to an end. With its imposing marble facade, the majestic Benedictine church of San Miniato al Monte, The three-nave-long building, with its open Gothic roof truss, is alternately supported by columns and pillars. The chancel is above the crypt. In the lower part of the church are kept the mortal remains of Minus, from whom the church derived its name. The history of Prato, the town lying on the right bank of Vincenzio, dates back to the Middle Ages as the imperial foundation on the road to Apulia. Monticatini, Alto situated high on the mountain. This old settlement is a well-kept jewel of the past. In the valley below, the most important and most modern of the Tuscany spas was built. The Monticatini thermals are captivating due to the turn of the century architecture of the health resorts covered walkways and foyers. Everywhere, one can feel the noble nostalgia of a bygone era.
The Rack Railway climbs to the top of the mountain through orchards and fields to Monte Catino Alto, where a wonderful view awaits. Carlo Lorenzini took the pseudonym of Collidi to write the most read and most famous Italian book, The Adventures of Pinocchio. With this name, he wanted to pay tribute both to his mother's place of birth and to his happy childhood, which he spent in this Tuscany village. In 1953, a monument for the author in the form of Pinocchio Park was built for the joy of the children and also for the young at heart. The fantastic portrayal of various scenes and adventures bring the story to life and turn the fantasy of Pinocchio into reality. All the famous Tuscany families had a palace in the city and a villa in the country. The Villa Torrigiani is a fine example of a grand summer residence. In 1636, Marchese Santini ambassador of the former Republic of Lucca in the court of the Sun King of Versailles acquired this estate and had the villa and park built with pond and flower garden, fountains and grottoes. In recent years, many of these magnificent villas were restored and are frequently open to the public. The journey takes us further, along the narrow Circhio Valley. A visit to Ponte del Diavolo is essential. Its bold and vibrant stone arches span the river Circhio. The 11th century Devil's Bridge is testament to early bridge design and is still standing today. Surrounded by an array of large fields, a long drive alongside the colossal city wall brings us to the entrance gate. Mm -hmm. 
One of the most important historical towns of Tuscany rises from the lower reaches of the Circhio River on a former swamp. Lucca, a charming town dating from the Middle Ages, is surrounded by a massive 4.2 kilometer long brick wall. This fortress wall helped Lucca retain its independence and also protected it from the floodwaters of the Circhio. Luca's marketplace used to be a romantic amphitheatre, the seating of which was rebuilt into houses. The importance of the town reached its climax around 180 BC because the so-called Franken Road passed through it, the most important transport and trading route to Rome. But during the Middle Ages, part of the swamps dried out and the road became less important. From here, Goths and Langobards ruled the region. And in 1369, Lucca was made a free town republic. The bishop's residence was founded in the 6th century and construction of the Duomo San Martino commenced in 1060. Beautiful rounded arches, marbled facades with relief scenes from the life of Holy Martin, a 69 meter high campanile and a strict Gothic interior with immediately recognizable elements of the Renaissance. In the small squares there are market stalls where handicrafts are displayed. Beneath the stern gaze of several statues, talented craftsmen display their art. In the centre, romantic churches blend with houses and patriciere palaces which date back four centuries. Only in the mid-16th century was the city's independence lost when it was integrated into the Grand Duchy of Tuscany. The journey continues over the Monte Pisano, past Cyprus tree-lined paths, through splendid green avenues, to Pisa. Everyone knows that it's leaning, but to that extent? The cathedral and campanile were built on sand. During its construction, Builders tried to prevent it from tilting, but for some time were forced to stop. A hundred years later, they dared to start again. Together, the cathedral, Baptisterium and Campanile form a unique harmony and with its large lawned square 
are of monumental proportion. In those days, the grandeur of the buildings was due to the liberal mindedness of those in power. The interior of the cathedral gives an overwhelming impression with its mixture of early Christianity, Byzantine and Islamic styles which belong to Italy's early monuments. It was in Siena that Henry VII died unexpectedly of malaria. The people of Pisa let him be buried in their cathedral. With its pumpkin-shaped dome, the Battistero is like a monumental relic. The portal leading to the cathedral is decorated with Mary and Child. Narrow steps lead to the inner dome of the huge baptism chapel. In the courtyard of the Composanto Cemetery, there is reverent silence. Deep respect for this place begs silent prayers. Through the dainty filigree of Gothic arcades, subdued light enters within. After countless years, these venerable buildings have lost nothing of their impressive effect. Through the shady streets of the old city, the light stone façade of Santa Maria del Spina illuminates like a shaft of faith. It possesses one of the thorns from Christ's crown. On the other side of this sacred monument is the Palazzo de Cavalieri. Its enormous size and the splendor of its decoration stand proud. Here the busts of governing rulers are portrayed, as well as the commanders who were assigned to protect the city against a constant tide of pagan Saracens. Pisa developed as a city of science, closely associated with the scholarly Galileo Galilei who, with the aid of chandeliers in the cathedral, invented the pendulum rule. San Miniato. The origins of this ancient city go back to the Etruscans and Romans. The military base was called Quarto. In 783 AD, the Langobards built a church here and a village developed named after the Holy Miniato. Otto I had the castle built in 962 AD and moved the jurisdiction of the whole of Tuscany to this city.
The view over the surrounding hilly countryside is what the earliest inhabitants must have seen and felt. Olive groves and vineyards line the gentle hilly landscape around this picturesque place, Vinci. The birthplace of Leonardo is a simple farmhouse above the square. Only a plain bust modestly portrays this great universal genius. The area stretches along the brow of a hill and in the small castle in the center, the Leonardo da Vinci Museum was built. Here, we can admire some of Leonardo's amazing inventions and attempt to let the soul of the Renaissance thinker influence us. He was a painter, illustrator, sculptor, architect and designer and carried out natural and artistic sciences. Leonardo da Vinci was the embodiment of an idealistic, universally educated artist. Chataldo was a middle-aged village built of red brick and surrounded by Florence, Siena and Pisa. Friedrich Barbarossa gave the village to Count Alberti, who governed for a long time and whose residence was in Palazzo Pretorio. During their entire governorship, the family Alberti were strong opposers of Florence. Chataldo is world famous because here the author Giovanni Boccaccio was born and on 12th of December 1375 he died here. Built on a hill, the Palazzo Pretorio was under the direct rule of Florence, the seat of the Vicariats. During this period, the expanding city enjoyed the heyday of its development and became the most important center in the Elsa Valley. Wide valleys, gentle rolling hills with vineyards, olive groves and fertile fields. Dark pine and cypress trees offer cool shade. Ancient instincts spring to life on the way to San Vivaldo. Under the management of the Franciscans, in Palestine, holy shrines have been in existence since Francis of Assisi. Thus, returning from a visit to Jerusalem, two monks were inspired to duplicate these holy places. 
In 1550, San Vivaldo was created with 34 chapels within which are portrayed Christ's passion, resurrection and ascension. Tuscany awakes the human spirit. In a warm breeze, swaying wheat fields characterize the picturesque landscape where cypress trees gently murmur a song of the south. San Gimignano, city of towering houses, also named the Manhattan of Tuscany. Founded by Etruscan settlers, it was later named after the Bishop of Moderna. At various times in the Middle Ages, there were up to 72 castle-like living quarters, totally encircled by a double wall punctuated by five city gates. This place once lay along the Franken Road and the inhabitants became rich through profitable trading and the planting of saffron for dyeing silk material. Enemies to the death, noble rivals had defiant towers built in the whole city area. The higher the towers, the more strategic for attacking their enemies and the more prestige. Those who could not afford to build high towers were left defenseless. Only with a municipal decree against mindless luxury was the building madness of the fighting factions restrained. No tower was allowed to exceed a height of 54 meters, the height of the council building. Wealthy inhabitants of the city also had churches and palaces built, and famous artists committed themselves to their creation. Thus originated the Cathedral Collegiata and the Church of Sant'Agostino, plus the Palazzo del Comune. The business centre of the city is represented by the Piazza della Cisterna, the centre of which is decorated with an octagonal cisterna. From the outside, the simple church of Collegiata, with its monumental steps and small cloister, has many frescoes and paintings on its interior walls and ceilings. Thanks to its 14 well-maintained towers and several noble palaces and churches, San Gimignano, situated in the midst of hilly olive groves, belongs to those cities of Tuscany which to this day have managed to retain their middle age character.
Appearing like a small fortress amongst the hills, a short detour takes us to the village of Monte Regione. Sturdy, well-maintained defensive walls protect a small array of properties. Continuing our short journey, we reach the monumental city of art and culture, Siena. The heart of Tuscany lies around the provincial capital of Siena, a Gothic city of great artistry. Built on a narrow, steep range of hills, the city adapted itself to the special features of the terrain. The entire structure, its squares and streets, most of the residential quarters and noble palaces, the Palazzo Publico, the cathedral and the church, all date back to the 13th and 14th centuries. At the highest point of the city, in black and white marble, the majestic cathedral is supreme. Its facade is a gem of Italian architecture. At its base, Roman style with three large portals, as opposed to its towering, richly decorated Gothic triple spires. The cathedral's triple nave is copied from the design of a Latin cross. White and black marble stripes represent Siena's traditional colours. Around the entire middle nave, there is a gallery with the busts of 172 popes. Construction of the hexagonal dome, which is mounted on six pillars, took five years. The upper part tapers into twelve sections. The history of one of the most beautiful cathedrals in Europe goes back a long time. At the peak of their wealth and power, the people of Siena wanted to add an even larger Duomo Nuovo. Alas, the plague arrived, and with it only the external walls remained standing. The centre of the city is represented by Il Campo, the most beautiful square in Italy. Since the early Middle Ages, the worldly centre of the city was here. Gothic palaces, cafes and restaurants line the circumference of the shell-shaped square, paved with red bricks and with a large fountain at its highest point. A number of Renaissance palaces are to be found in this Gothic city. Numerous narrow steps and alleys lead up to the cathedral, or down to the impressive city hall Il Campo, between delicate arches, sleepy nooks and crannies, and characteristic houses constructed from burnt clay. Pope Pius II was born in Corsignano. At the height of his papacy, he ordered the Florentine architect Rossellino to build here a cathedral with a bishop's palace, a family palace 
and a small communal palace. All situated around a central brick paved square. The interior of the church was built in Latin cross form and in the style of the churches which Pius II favoured and became accustomed to on his travels in Northern Europe. The beautiful small main square forms a wonderful harmony of elements and is the city's aesthetic focal point. There is no main entrance to this square, just side entrances which also give it an alternative perspective. In only a few years of building, between 1459 and 1462, the only true city of the Renaissance was founded. It was then renamed Pienza, the city of Pius. Due to a lack of space, the new cathedral was built on a slope from mud and loam, which, even during its construction, began to show signs of stress. Dangerous vertical cracks in the church nave were the result. Constant renovations and reinforcements had to be undertaken to prevent a total collapse of the apsis. The spot where Pienza stands today had been inhabited in past centuries. Remains of ancient settlements were discovered which stemmed back from the early Stone Age to the Roman occupation in the Middle Ages. The restoration of the city also included the rebuilding of Corso Rossellino with its cardinal's palaces, plus the construction of 12 homes for its incumbents. From the balcony of the residential palace Piccolo Mini, there is a marvelous view over the Orcha Valley and the extinct cone-shaped volcano of Monte Amiata. Since childhood, Pope Pius II adored this view. Monte Pulciano lies on a tough stone hill between Chiana and Orcha Valley. Buildings ranging from early Renaissance to Baroque were the chosen styles for the large families of the nobility. Monte Policiano, as the Romans called it, must have existed since the Etruscan era. Its heyday was the 15th and 16th centuries and its many palaces and churches a testament to its former wealth. In 1561, it was declared as the bishop's seat and a massive cathedral was built in place of the middle-aged parish church. Near to the entrance, there is a masterpiece of Michelozzo, the monument of Bartolomeo Aragazzi, administrator for Pope Martin V.
Lying higher up and completely surrounded by a wall, for wine connoisseurs, the small town of Monte Pulciano is well known. Here, the noblest wine of Tuscany is produced, Vino Nobile. Here, time appears to have stood still. Among these palaces, visitors feel that they have been taken back to an aristocratic way of life. At approximately 197,000 acres and divided into over 700 wine growing estates, in the hilly region between Florence and Siena is a name famous all over the world for its wine Chianti country. Here the hills reach an optimum height for the wine, 250 to 600 meters. The first vines were planted by the Etruscans, and in the early Middle Ages it was the monks of Vallambrosa who cleared the uninhabited hilly slopes and cultivated the first vineyards. Chianti is made from four different grape varieties and today follows the same formula as that laid down by Baron Bettino Ricasoli in the year 1874. Tuscany wines, especially Chianti, went out of favour in the 1950s. But with a lot of hard work and commitment, once again they have become a worldwide export. The Gallo Nero, the ruby red wine of Chianti. The road winds through hilly vineyards and the rays of the late afternoon sun create a richly contrasting and romantic picture. Tuscany as illustrated in the perfect picture book, a gentle sunny paradise which turns the visitor into a connoisseur of the senses. A seemingly limitless, undulating countryside as modelled by sculptors. Throughout the past century, human hands styled Italy's garden. The endless individual contours of hills and mountains. A feeling of shape, infinitely bold, but also playful and free. The conclusion of the elitist connection between nature and art. To experience and feel the full beauty of this landscape, this is the indescribable fascination of Tuscany. <laughs>